Hi there, welcome to your second lecture for week seven of uh, Contemporary Art. Today we're going to look at the emergence of feminist art in the 1970s. Let me preface this by saying a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> the feminist movement, or, or actually the women's rights movement, is actually much older than the 1970s, starting really in the 1830s and 1840s, especially with the 1848 Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls in New York, there have been for generations, women pushing for more rights for women. Uh, it took the women's rights movement from 1848 until 1920 to get an amendment passed to the U.S. Constitution that allowed women to vote. So it's been a long, slow progress from uh, early on until uh, today, really. And I know that especially among younger people, um, some of the sort of background of feminism is not that well known. So that's part of what we're going to be talking about today and part of what you'll be reading about this week when you're reading about um, the emergence of feminist art in the 1970s. Keep in mind, I'm going to show you a few women artists who are working in the 1950s here in just a minute. And the work that I show you from the 1950s, if I were to ask you about it on an exam, do not classify it as feminist art because that is not really what it is. Just because it's by a woman doesn't mean that it's feminist art. Feminism had a real resurgence as do um, a, a number of other political movements come together, coalesce in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, a number of different groups that had been marginalized in political and social and cultural life of America really start pushing for inclusion. Uh, women, for example, also, we mentioned the environmental movement when we were looking at land art, but more tied to like personal identity, there's a women's movement that emerges during this time, although again, the women's movement had been around, but it gets this new kind of life in the 60s and especially the 70s. Also at this time, as we'll be talking about next week, there is a new resurgence of a black cultural movement and a black nationalist movement in the 1970s. Other groups start to demand a place at the table, too. Uh, this is the era that sees the creation of the American Indian Movement, which is a, another kind of political action group that's trying to get recognition for Native American issues. Also at this time is the beginning of the gay rights movement, uh, really kicked off by an event that happened in the late 1960s when the um, a, a bar in downtown New York, in Greenwich Village actually, was raided and a bunch of people were arrested. It was a gay bar and people were arrested simply for being at the gay bar. Uh, these are all groups that had been legally constricted and um, essentially denied civil rights during the period leading up to all these protest movements of the 1960s and 70s. We're going to concentrate on the politics of feminism during this time and how it translated into a kind of feminist approach to making art and critiquing art history. Next time we'll talk about the black arts movement. So, uh, but anyway, I just want you to understand that we're talking about a kind of larger environment in which many groups that had been pushed to the side are demanding to be included in the mainstream. Okay, so first of all, I want to show you some abstract expressionist painters from the 1950s. This is a painting called Billboard, as you can see. Very much an abstract expressionist style painting with that kind of slap, uh, slapping on thickly layered and textured paint. Some figural imagery, but really a lot of areas, just passages of color. Um, very much part of that kind of New York School expressive style of the 1950s. And as you can see, this is a painting that was signed by an artist named George Hardigan. Well, George Hardigan was actually a woman named Grace Hardigan. Uh, in the 1950s, when she began working professionally, she's still around, by the way, she's still painting, uh, but when she began working in the 50s, she could not get gallery representation when she signed her paintings Grace Hardigan. Uh, it just was not that common for women to work as artists, and so she decided that in order to have her paintings judged on their own merits and to have them judged apart from any idea that, oh, she's a girl, uh, she would sign them George. Okay, so George Hardigan in the 1950s, she changed and started um, working, you know, painting in, in a more or excuse me, or signing her work with her own name later on, but early on she does these 
essentially abstract expressionist paintings that she signs with a, a male pseudonym in order to avoid the problems of being a woman and being an artist in the 1950s. And here's just another example of one of her abstract expressionist style paintings from the later 1950s. So if I were to show you this on a test, you should not identify it as feminist art because there is nothing about it that is meant to engage with the specific questions of gender or her identity as a woman. This is really a painting done in the formalist tradition of work like Jackson Pollock, where the painting is an object unto itself. It's not meant to engage with any kind of specific political content. It is simply a work of abstract expressionism. So I hope you can see what I'm saying here, that not everything that's painted by women is necessarily feminist art. Okay, Feminist art has a particular set of concerns that it's engaged with that are not part of what Grace Hardigan is doing here. What's interesting is she's a woman at a time in New York, which remember in the 1950s is the world's art capital, who is facing the challenges that are basically the social restrictions that are placed on women at this time. Uh, she was fr friends with a new, another woman who was working at this time and running into the same kinds of problems. And I think you might remember when we were looking at abstract expressionism, we looked at the men who were kind of the icons of the movement, de Kooning and Pollock. And remember, their wives were always pictured in dresses in the background, uh, passively sitting, admiring their husbands. There were these expectations of gender that were present in the 1950s that meant that, you know, socially there were certain ways to behave that were acceptable and certain ways that were not acceptable. What you have to understand, and I think that people sometimes don't remember, is that this went far beyond just the way that people might be pictured in a photograph. This t translated into law, it translated into hiring practices. Um, the generation of women that were professionals in the 1950s faced an incredible uphill set of obstacles. So, uh, you may know this, you may not know this, Sandra Day O'Connor, the recently retired Supreme Court Justice, she and her husband went to the same law school in the 50s. And in fact, Sandra Day O'Connor graduated uh, higher ranking it than him with a better GPA. But when they went to go get jobs, Sandra Day O'Connor could not get a job as a lawyer, even though she had passed the bar and she had a great GPA and she had graduated from the same school as her husband. They would only hire her as a paralegal. They hired her husband to work as a lawyer. And that was perfectly um, socially acceptable at the time. All right? So think about that. I mean, it's not just that it, it, it's structurally nearly impossible at this time for women to just work in a profession simply because they want to. There were similar things, by the way, for African Americans. I mean, if you were an African American, you could get a doctorate in chemistry and not find anybody who would be willing to hire you. And in fact, this actually happened. There were some scientists who ended up working for a black-owned pharmaceutical company um, who were very highly trained, very good academically respected chemists, but could not get jobs at white-owned firms. This kind of systemic discrimination was simply the, the accepted law of the land. I think sometimes, especially nowadays, we don't realize that this was the way that things were. So you have to understand where women are at in the 1950s or um, later, where African Americans are at in the power structure of society um, to really understand why these movements take off the way that they do. Ah, so here's Miriam Shapiro. I was just telling you about Sandra Day O'Connor. Miriam Shapiro had a similar experience. This is her, of course, abstract expressionist style. She's working in the 1950s. She's just graduated with an MFA. She and her husband both graduated with MFAs from the same program, both working in what was the hot style of the day. As you can see, she's very much in that ABEX mode. Uh, he, her husband, she and her husband both had MFAs from the same school. When they moved to New York, her husband got a job teaching painting at the new school. She could only find a job working as a secretary. Her MFA was not enough to get her into um, 
a job as a teacher. She was a woman, therefore, I mean, the, the thinking of the day was, well, she's just going to quit in a year or two to have babies anyway, so we don't really want to hire her. All right. So, uh, and there's some of this kind of stuff that still goes on, but it's much less um, egregious now because of certain laws that have been passed. So, uh, and in fact, you know, Shapiro said, I mean, she and her husband hung out in the same circle of people who knew Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Willem de Kooning. They meet, they would meet weekly at a place called the Cedar, um, the Cedar Bar to talk about art theory and to kind of share ideas and things like that. And she said that she, a couple of things were really important to her. One of all, one was that, um, she had to get her own studio space because when she shared studio space with her husband, everybody treated her like she was just a hobbyist, like it was a cute little affectation that she wanted to paint, like she was just copying after her husband. Two, she said she found it very frustrating that she was basically socially unable to operate simply as an artist within this environment. If you went to the Cedar Bar alone, she said, you had you were setting yourself up for um, basically being hit on, okay? If you went to the Cedar Bar alone, there was no assumption that you were there to talk shop and to talk about art with the, the other abstract expressionist painters. The assumption was that you were there essentially, pardon my language, um, to get laid, all right? So <clears throat> this is another aspect of kind of the way people are thinking in this time period and the way that the sort of cultural norms are set that early feminist artists are going to start to try to rebel against. And this is one of the last Miriam Shapiro's that we're going to look at that's sort of pre her involvement in California with Judy Chicago and the Feminist Art Project, which you have a lot to read about this week. This is Big Ox number two from 1968. As you can see, it is kind of moving along. I mean, she's obviously keeping up with the trends and what's going on. Uh, this very kind of op art, pop art looking abstract painting, a little bit like a minimalist painting, uh, really kind of keeping up with current trends in what has become the modus operandi of the 1960s. Nothing in this is particularly gendered in content. I mean, you might be able to say there's some hint of genitalia or something like that, but I think it'd be a bit of a stretch. This is before she really goes into what we would call feminist um, a feminist mode of doing art. Uh, but this is a, another example of early women working in a male-dominated environment and dealing with some of the challenges of that. Shapiro, in fact, you'll be reading some um, interview excerpts with her, had been doing okay at getting her work shown. She had, been got, she had gotten pretty successful. When she first met, first met Judy Chicago, uh, and she's a little bit older than Judy Chicago, <clears throat> she, um, you know, resisted the idea that she really needed to address the fact that she was female and that there were certain constraints placed upon her by being a female. Uh, she kind of resented that notion because she was like, listen, you know, I'm getting shown, I'm getting my work in galleries. But as Sh Chicago said to her, yeah, but a lot of times your work is misunderstood or you're misunderstood, you're misrepresented being a woman and being an artist. And it took it took uh, Shapiro a little while, she says, to really kind of think through that idea and then, uh, you know, want to start to wrestle with it and engage with it. So the stuff I've been showing you, don't classify it as feminist art simply because it's made by women. It's made by women in the atmosphere of the time, and I wanted to show it to you to give you a sense of the sort of general background from which feminist art will then take off and emerge. Here's a case in point. I brought a couple of things in just to show you uh, some of the tenor of <clears throat> the way that people uh, represented women in the 50s, 60s, and even the 70s. There's also online, for your viewing pleasure, a Maxwell House coffee ad from the early 70s that will give you a little bit of a sense of the way that um, it was deemed acceptable to talk to and about women at the time. Uh, remember, I'm trying to give you a sense of this both from sort of a cultural perspective and then from a legal perspective of, as well. Through this period when the very controversial um, court case Roe versus Wade is being decided, other aspects of femalehood are also very much under um, an interesting set of, of laws and regulations. For example, 
in most states of the in the United States in most states up until actually the 80s it was legally impossible for a husband to rape his wife think about that I we could be talking about an estranged couple okay a case of domestic violence as long as they were still legally married a husband even if he beat the crap out of his wife and forced himself upon her even if there was plenty of physical evidence that it was not consensual sex legally speaking a husband could not be considered to rape his wife as long as they were legally married it was considered his prerogative okay um, in the, up until actually and I had a good friend who had a hysterectomy in the late 80s and her husband had to sign a permission form that said it was okay with him if the doctor performed a hysterectomy on her with the idea being that the husband had some legal claim over the the wife's body and her capability to reproduce all right uh, it was illegal for unmarried women to get birth control prescriptions throughout the 1960s uh, there are just a lot of ways in which women were essentially treated as second-class citizens or as property of their husbands they were belittled as being less than their husbands or less than men it's a kind of pervasive cultural attitude that that is manifested in stuff like an ad like this here this guy saying you know my wife was just such a bitch while she's on her period and make sure she gets this because then she won't be such a troll anymore okay which I mean can you imagine an ad like this happening today I can't really imagine it uh, but it just I'm trying to give you a sense of the the cultural atmosphere in which <clears throat> women who become feminist artists are operating a culture in which women are typically belittled or written out of history or written out of politics told to stay at home told to enjoy um, having new appliances things like that oh and speaking of which it, and I'm showing you this because this will also become fodder for the kind of art that's made in the 1970s the subject matter of a lot of feminist art in the 70s will be these kinds of questions of what it means to be a woman what your biology means whether being a woman is something that is built in and, and whether that determines in some biological essential way something that makes you different from and less than a man things like that uh, so I just wanted to show you some of the background fodder for what we'll see in 1970s art here's just a typical 1955 ad from a magazine showing you know a happy housewife at home in the kitchen with this great um, new technology nothing particularly insidious about an ad like this I mean of course here this woman's you know baking a or making a five course meal wearing a high heels and a dress and all of that but I mean nothing particularly insidious except that this was the only role that women were perceived to have in most of what you see in visual culture in the 50s and into the 60s not only in advertising but in sitcoms you know and in movies uh, it's kind of everywhere this expectation that this is what a woman is and nothing else through the 60s and there's another happy housewife with her kitchen appliances in the 1950s there on the right uh, this became more sexualized as time went on it's kind of an interesting correspondence to the 1960s era of free love and the sexual revolution and the new availability of birth control pills in some ways I mean it just made things more explicitly sexual women did not really necessarily um, become more powerful there weren't more women in Congress there weren't more women CEOs there were more ads however like the one on the left this very famous air airline campaign from the 19 early 1970s in print and on television the National Airlines fly me campaign and on TV and I actually remember some of these from when I was little on TV they would have a 30 second spot that would show you the comfortable planes of national airlines and then they would end with a beautiful flight attendant saying hi I'm so and so fly me okay which I think you can see is not too much of a stretch to have some sort of sexual innuendo contained in there and in fact national got sued by some of their flight attendants who said I mean they had to wear buttons on their uniforms that said fly me and um, the suit said alleged that you know this was essentially being 
treated as a come on by male passengers and so they were subject to constant kind of sexual harassment in the workplace that was being encouraged by National's uh, ad campaign. The suit was actually, um, th they lost the, the lawsuit and they had to wear the fly me buttons. The planes themselves would have, um, you know, sexy pictures of a woman on the nose cone a la 1940s uh, World War II airplane art, With then the planes would get named so you could fly the plane. So I think you can see where there's a kind of, um, you know, ongoing um, objectification of women or narrowing of the idea of what women are all about and sort of this range of the happy housewife or the, um, or the, very accommodating flight attendant are the site the kinds of media images that were pervasive in that era. So in that era then you have the um, emergence of a new paradigm in um, political activity. There are women organizing and getting together and um, marching and holding what are called consciousness raising sessions where they talk about these issues and talk about how they've been raised to think there are only certain things that women can do, there are only certain expectations you should have. The goal of your life should be to grow up and get married and have children. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with getting married and having children, okay? But the thing that people are protesting against and the thing that women are organizing against in the feminist movement of this time is the the idea that that's it there is nothing outside of that that is available for women and that because women have female bodies they are essentially unable to do anything but be at home and have families and procreate this idea that there's something essential about your biology is, uh, is actually become a term of theory, and you'll run into this when you read the feminist, uh, feminist uh, theory piece from Andaliva this week, um, this essentialism, this idea that your body is your destiny. And that will become one of the major themes of early feminist art. Miriam Shapiro moves out west, joins forces eventually, as you'll be reading about, with Judy Chicago, who's also who's grown up out or is out in the uh, in Fresno and um, the two of them collaborate on creating a new art school specifically for women who are artists to work on the kinds of issues that are that are important especially to women who are thinking through all of this political and cultural stuff in the 1970s and one of the first things they do is they orchestrate with their students a temporary installation that is in an abandoned house in um, Los Angeles in 1972. It's uh, occupied for about six months and they basically transform the interior of the house into a series of galleries in which there are installations and then performance pieces that are produced. It becomes, I mean, and this makes sense, right? I mean, if women are tied to home and family, then having an installation inside a house, having a whole house that becomes a kind of quasi-sculpture installation performance space uh, makes sense. It's an environment in which then all of these issues can be thought through and talked about. I should tell you a story. Uh, actually, I'll wait to tell you the story about 2D Chicago. So um, early... So this is this example of uh, this early project, and you'll have lots of reading about Woman House in the one article I've got posted for this week. So here's the kitchen from Woman House, which, as you can see, actually had all been painted white, and the walls have been covered by these forms that start out as eggs from a frying pan and morph into breasts, okay? So this installation, or this one room, that's got a kind of, you know, conglomeration of sculpture and stuff going on. Uh, it's a fairly new medium related to performance and related to concept and all of that. Um, this is a way of kind of making manifest certain associations between woman and fertility and reproduction and cooking and the kind of stereotypical role of woman that is so prominent in the 1950s era sitcoms and ads and things like that. Remember, if this is 1972, 
that this is being done. The artists who are doing this work are people who grew up in the 1950s, and that's the predominant image they're taking with them and engaging with. And it's certainly not an image that had gone away by 1972. In fact, in the 1970s, Maxwell House coffee, which you're going to see the one ad from Maxwell House just to give you a sense of the kind of flavor of the times, um, they actually had a character or a concept they called the Maxwell housewife, you know. Um, be a good little Maxwell housewife, says the man in one uh, Maxwell House commercial. I couldn't find it on YouTube. It was killing me. Uh, be a good little Maxwell housewife or you're going to have to walk the plank, uh, says the husband to his wife on their boat in one of these commercials. So, I mean, in the 1970s, this whole idea of, like, the domesticated housewife has not gone away, and that's part of what's being dealt with in Woman House. There's another view of the kitchen, so you can see those eggs morphing into breast shapes there, and then all the kitchen implements on the back wall. Here's a linen closet from Woman House, and here again, I mean, this is a obviously a mannequin that's been taken from a department store. I mean, this is another aspect of the iconic stereotypical role of women at this time this is a uh, and here she's literally being sucked into the house she's being bisected by the house she's being cut up by the house by and she's being incorporated into the linen closet trapped in the linen closet beheaded by the linen closet okay I mean there's all sorts of ways you can read this but I think you can see how there's <clears throat> this kind of implication of the the way women get um, um, sucked into this sort of domestic role. There were also performance pieces, several different performance pieces, and there are some images of some of them available in Art Store. It's not the most well-documented um, art uh, piece of art that we have, as the Balducci article will talk about. Um, it wasn't valued as much by people outside of this kind of small, tight-knit community of student artists um, as it has become later, well, to some degree in art history. Anyway, so this is uh, one of the students there doing a performance where she's ironing in the woman house. Because again, that's one of the things that, you know, is sort of an iconic female occupation. And here's Miriam Shapiro's contribution to the dollhouse of her, or to the woman house of her own. This is the dollhouse. I mean, typical what little girls play with, the kind of, and, you know, it's a little miniaturized. Um, captive little room or captive little set of rooms. There's some interesting stuff going on here, particularly in that top right room in which there is an artist studio where you can see Shapiro wrestling with another part of the fundamental interests of early uh, feminist artists. If one is this question of gender and biology and the destiny of woman and these stereotypes that are floating in the air in the 1970s. Uh, another part of the whole feminist project is to talk about the whole history of art history and why women have been marginalized out of art history. The earliest feminist approaches to looking at the whole history of art come out of the 1970s. This is when artists start to really question some of the traditional norms of art and art history as well. So here's a close-up of the dollhouse, or the artist studio from the dollhouse. Um, 1979, that's a, I'm sorry, that's a typo. 72 is the original creation here. This is the artist studio. And what Shapiro has done here is play with a long tradition of representations of artists in their studios. One of the big projects of feminism in history and art history is to look at the biases that are inherent in the way that history is written, that privileges the idea of men going out and conquering stuff, when, you know, for most of history, women have just simply not been able to be soldiers, so that would essentially write women out of history. In the case of art history, women have been around art for a long time. I mean, you can't swing a dead cat in 19th century art without hitting 10 female nudes, right? I mean, so to speak. There, the woman has been an object Woman has been a thing to look at and contemplate in the nude for millennia in the history of Western art. Women are not typically treated as subjects in art. That is, they're not typically treated up until the, say, 20th century, not typically treated as active agents of their own fate, 
not typically treated uh, or looked at as artists. They are often looked at as um, as things to look at, you know. And so here, Shapiro is taking that idea and turning it a little bit on its head. She's got a traditional artist studio with a garret window there, and there's a nice easel painting on an easel that is a abstract version, like an early 20th century abstraction, like a Mondrian of, a, of the window pane that she's looking out. And then there on the left in the background, you've got those corks that are um, turned into a sculpture. That is a direct reference to the early 20th century modernist Constantine Brancusi and his Endless Tower. And then there in the studio, you have a male model, nude except for a pair of boots, standing on a platform for the female artist to stare at and enjoy. And here you can see that only his salient parts have been um, included. He doesn't have a face because who needs a face, right? He's just a body. He's just an object. He's just a thing to look at. And this is, by the way, Brancusi in his studio with his uh, endless column, his endless tower. So I just thought it was interesting to show you that. She's trying to turn the tables on traditional representations of artists in their studios or the studio of the artist, which normally the gender is the male artist, there he is, this is Courbet, 19th century painting, a real allegory of seven years of life in my studio. There, his studio populated with people and friends, um, both living and dead. A painting of his on the easel that he's working on, and then a nude female model, who at this point he's not looking at, but I mean, she's there to, as an object to be painted in the studio, and she's standing behind him, gazing admiringly at his work. That is sort of the traditional role of the woman in an artist studio, is not as the artist, but as the object to be looked at. In fact, for those of you taking 19th century right now, you may have run into the Olympia by uh, Edouard Manet, very famous nude, broad on a couch, as we like to say, staring out of the canvas at you, very confrontational. It was very controversial when it was um, created because Olympia was thought to be a prostitute. What you may know if you've taken 19th century is um, that Olympia, the, the model who posed for Olympia, was actually a painter herself. We don't even have um, any verified surviving works from this painter because it was very difficult for her as a woman to get work, to get accepted into galleries, to be shown because she was female, even though she was a painter. And the way that she got into the art world was by modeling nude for male painters. So there's the artist model of the dollhouse. Again, I think it's interesting because she's really gone out of her way to elaborate his genitalia and leave him faceless as a direct kind of commentary on that erasure of identity that happened so much for women in the history of art. Shapiro also ventures into new media to create a kind of female version of painting. She uh, starts in the 1970s working with these brightly colored collages that use materials traditionally associated with women. So decorative stuff like wallpaper, um, lace, uh, embroidery, anything flowery and floral to create collages. And this, um, she t coined a new term for the medium that she invented. She calls them femages, so a kind of combination of female and collage. This was a way to try to, not only in subject matter, but here in media and technique, to try to intervene in the history of art and reclaim or claim a status for materials associated with women as high art. Um, one of the other complaints besides this, the objecthood of women in art that art historians and feminist artists had was that the kind of, uh, kind of objects produced by women, which require a high level of skill and dedication and training, were the way that oil painting did for men, were objects that were never considered masterpieces of art, even if they should have been. Quilts, um, china painting, uh, embroidery, samplers, these are things that were time consuming, required creativity, design sense, planning, expertise, all the things that are required for a man making an oil painting. But because they were created by women, um, because they were oftentimes useful objects like quilts as, as, as well as being um, beautiful, they don't get any status in the art world. That's changed in the last, you know, I don't know, 
20 years or so. But, I mean, this is one of the things that was being addressed by feminist artists and critics at the time, and that's where Fomage comes from as well. And here's another example. This dates to, I think, 76 or so. My nosegays are for captives. This was at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art a couple of years ago. And here again, you can see, I mean, it's, it's a lot of floral, delicate, beautiful fabrics and organza aprons and pieces of embroidery, the kind of stuff that you could pick up, you know, at the Goodwill for 50 cents, the kinds of stuff your grandma might have shoved in the back of a kitchen drawer that she's reclaiming and putting into an oil painting for a fromage to claim a spot for women in and women's crafts or women's creations in the gallery and in the museum world. The title of this actually comes from an Emily Dickinson poem, a mid-19th century Emily Dickinson poem, which I won't read out loud to you, but you can pause on this and uh, pa if you want. And you can see how there's this kind of melancholy poem about captives plucking nosegays, and Emily Dickinson, uh, this reclusive 19th century poet whose work was not known until after her death when it was published. Uh, apart from a few fra a few poems were published during her lifetime, but she really became famous after her death, and then she became a real hero for women in the in the 1970s as an example of a woman who was writing really powerful and very respected poetry. I mean, it's you know canonical now, um, but who was constrained by the expectations and the society of her day, so that her creative genius was not able to be. Um, appreciated during her lifetime. So there's that as a subject matter as well as the material of this fromage that are feminist in nature. And she continued to work with fromages here is a 1990s piece that as you can see is based on quilting and embroidery and also is heart-shaped, you know, traditionally kind of associated with girliness. Uh, so she's continued to work with this kind of um, idea since the 1970s. And I think you can, I mean, sorry, I just have to say this about Shapiro as well. That I mean, I think you can see the, the transformation from something like the painting Big Ox to something like the Fomage and how one is not really engaging in any kind of feminist critique of anything and one really is feminist art. Another branch of this feminist art of the 1970s is exemplified by this project, a student project that was um, overseen by Judy Chicago at the CalArts program and became a kind of performance version of the informal, um, the informal kind of uh, political group known as a consciousness raising group. Here in this piece, per this performance piece, the students in this project, which is called Ablutions, um, stripped naked, washed, and then were wrapped and bundled and tied up by other students in the performance. During this whole time, the, uh, there were speakers playing tapes of the students anonymously talking about ways they had been sexually assaulted in their lives. If they'd been raped, if they'd been a victim of incest, if they'd ever had, you know, non-consensual sex, they talked about that experience on tape. And then that played while this kind of uh, ritual performance was carried out of washing and cleansing, of binding and uh, of binding and tying. This is an early, I mean, it's a performance piece, you know, it's very much inspired by the recent trends in performance art that had really emerged in the 1960s that we've already seen and then took those to engage with concerns that were particular to women. Uh, the issue of domestic violence, I mean I already told you in the 1970s it was still legal for a husband to rape his wife essentially. It didn't matter if they were estranged or not as long as they were legally married a woman could not be raped by her husband. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that was being challenged by feminists and is being dealt with in something like ablutions. There's very little awareness of domestic violence at this time. Uh, in fact, you know, threats to beat your wife were standard fare in, in um, 1950 sitcoms like The Honeymooners. Even if you watch uh, The Flintstones, there are oftentimes, you know, Fred will threaten to beat the crap out of Wilma. Uh, so it was not something that was 
treated as a serious problem. It was treated as just the sort of, you know, this is how men and women operate. And so ablutions is really this piece trying to deal with and change people's minds about the experience of domestic violence. And here, I think this is interesting. This is a quote from one of the students at the program talking about why performance art became a preferred medium for feminist artists. She says, When I was growing up, I used to make my bed with precision movements, imagining that somehow the boy I wanted to marry was watching my performance and judging it. In the magazines and on television, we see women posing while mopping the kitchen floor, and we too learned to pose as women. We played house, only to grow up to get the starring role. Performance is not a difficult concept to us. We're on stage every moment of our lives, acting like women. Performance is a declaration of self, who one is, a shamanistic dance by which we spin into other states of awareness, remembering new visions of ourselves. And in performance, we found an art that was young, without the tradition of painting or sculpture, without the traditions governed by men. The shoe fit, and so, like Cinderella, we ran with it. So there you go. This is the idea, right? This is the idea of ablutions from 1972. That this would be, first of all, a consciousness-raising piece. That performance art was not so established in history that it had a whole tradition by men that had to be challenged or overturned. This was also, you know, a more powerful way to talk about some of these experiences. The so it, it sort of paired avant-garde form with a feminist political vision, okay? So here's just a couple more of the images from, from this performance by, these by this group, the student group. Uh, as the, as the uh, woman is being bound here, bound to the chair, and as you can see, all these other women are being bound into the performance as well, um, one of the phrases that was repeated over and over was, one woman recounting her experience of being raped saying, I felt so helpless, all I could do was lay there and cry. Now, stories about this performance are that the people who came to see it were shocked by it, you know, that it was not something that people were used to seeing talked about. It was not something that people were used to thinking about. And so it, it apparently had quite a big effect uh, within the limited history or within the limited realm of people who... Uh, of people who came to this particular performance. And there's another view of the performance, the woman being wrapped up and bound and dragged along. Okay, so one final piece of feminist art from the 70s to consider is Judy Chicago's massive installation known as The Dinner Party, which was a five-year-long collaborative project for which only she gets, uh, you know, name recognition when you read a survey textbook or whatever. Uh, but she was the orchestrator of this entire project. I saw Chicago speak several years ago and talk about her inspiration for making the dinner party. And she said she had, during her freshman year at, uh, I think it was at Cal State, a world history course. So the first day of class, the professor said, I'm at, I am saving a special lecture for the role of women in history for the last day of the semester, so stay tuned. And the last day of the semester, this is the story Chicago tells, the professor said, here's your lecture on women in history. Women have contributed nothing to world history. The end. Uh, this would have been in the late 50s when Judy Chicago was an undergrad student. And she was, uh, when I saw her several years ago, this was something that she could tell the story with a bit of humor and, you know, kind of joke about it, but it obviously was something that really galvanized her, and I can see why, you know, that women are nothing. Women have done nothing in history. I mean, to have a professor tell you that, my goodness. Um, and she decided, this was one of the early moments that made her decide that she wanted to work on women's issues. And so when this became kind of a, a political thing in the 70s, then she started to think about how you could express this in art. And we've already seen her working with Shapiro on Woman House and Ablutions. And now here in this collaborative effort with a whole team of women artists, she made this piece a triangular shaped table with uh, 33 place settings for some of history's most important women. For 
There are 999 other names of important women in history written on the tile floor that is in the center of the dinner party table. Each place setting for uh, each woman has a plate and a cup and a table runner. And the plate and the table runner each are designed to tell some important part of the story of that particular woman. Now, some really interesting things are going on here with the dinner party. First of all, she is challenging directly the way that history is written, the way that history was told by men like her teacher who said women have done nothing in history. So she's directly challenging that in the subject matter of the piece. The piece is a collaborative effort of a group of women. Um, meant to be a kind of community event, a consciousness raising event, a way for individual women to reclaim a sense of um, pride, you know. Uh, it also is, in the media, a feminist project. China painting, embroidery, quilting, needle crafts of all kind, all of these craft media that have always been denigrated as not art with a capital A. And here I think you can see where, I mean, look, we've looked at artists like Eve Klein and the Arte Povera movement, and we just looked at land art, all these non-traditional, um, you know, materials for making art. Here is a different spin on that idea of non-traditional art materials. This is what women have always done, and now we're going to make a massive installation that celebrates those media instead of denigrating those media or discounting them as mere craft. And here you can see a series of banners in the entryway uh, for the dinner party. So everything in this, uh, everything in this installation, including the kind of lead up to it, is done in these materials and media that are specific to women. Um, it actually, this was created in the 1970s. It got really mixed reviews when it first came out. In fact, uh, one critic complained about it. I'll tell you. Um, well, now nah, I'll wait a minute to tell you. But anyway, it took until the late 90s for the dinner party to find a permanent home. It's now actually at the Brooklyn Museum in New York City. <clears throat> but that was only about three or four years ago that it found a, f a permanent location. So it had only been seen uh, a couple of times since it was created in the 1970s. Here's a nice installation view of the dinner party. And here are close-ups of a couple of the place settings. Here are Virginia Woolf, and I forget who the other woman is there. But here you can see a kind of close-up of the plates on which uh, are the plates that are part of the place settings for these women. One critic who saw this show when it first was exhibited, or saw this art, this object when it was first exhibited, complained that this was this was nothing but, as he said, I'm quoting him here, nothing but a bunch of vaginas on plates. Now that's not accidental, all right. I mean, he dismissed it because, as you know, well, it's semi-pornographic. It's obviously referring to women's genitals. Um, actually, Judy Chicago said. She did this deliberately. She wanted to celebrate the core image, as she called it, the female image, the image of genitalia. She said, all throughout history, we have all these phallic images. Constantine Brancusi's tower is a big phallus, you know? All of these things, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a big phallus. Everything's all phallic. I want an art that celebrates the female genitalia. Uh, she's been critiqued for this, by the way, by people who say, you know, isn't being a woman more about than having a vagina? Isn't that just essentializing women? Uh, well, I'll leave that open for you to decide. But I mean, this is what she said. And I'm going to use a really bad four-letter word here, but I'm quoting Judy Chicago. She said, I wanted to make cunt art. In fact, when you read the um, little excerpt of interviews with Chicago and Shapiro, take note that <laughs> the editor actually replace that word with the phrase female genitalia with a note. Uh, there's a little asterisk by female genitalia, and he says at the bottom of the page, the editor says, I think CAA members probably read this to their children, and I didn't want them to hear this word, which I think is really interesting. How many people do you know actually sit down and read a scholarly journal to their kids? Uh, anyway, so, you know, it's a, from the early 70s, and apparently just way too much... Um, way too much to publish the C word there. So, uh, but anyway, this is where, I mean, Chicago's trying to be in your face about, about challenging some of the 
what she would have said or did say were sexist norms of art and art history with this kind of reclamation project. Here's another example. This is Hatshepsut's place setting. Hatshepsut was the only female pharaoh of Egypt. She actually, um, if you ever take A109, you'll encounter this. Uh, she actually is represented in statues wearing a beard, you know, and she was very controversial. Uh, the Egyptians at the time didn't really like, uh, and the subsequent rulers didn't really like the idea of a woman actually assuming pharaonic power, but she is an important woman in history. And here you can see the table runner and the, the uh, core image, the plate there, both done in a style that's meant to hark back to the style of Egyptian hieroglyphics. There's Virginia Woolf's place setting. That one is a particularly interesting. Virginia Woolf's early 20th century novelist and writer uh, wrote a really terrific small set of lectures called A Room of One's Own that really lays out an early uh, version of the critique that will become so common among feminist critics and artists, so uh, worth knowing about. But anyway, there she is. Uh, she's depicted here. She may You may know that she committed suicide by drowning. So there in one of her... Uh, she literally walked into a lake and just let herself drown. Uh, and there she is depicted in the V of Virginia with uh, surrounded by water. So one of the sort of pivotal moments in her life or the end of her life. And here are two more of the place settings. Mary Wollstonecraft on the left, Sojourner Truth on the right. Sojourner Truth was a former slave who helped to campaign to end slavery and then to help the freed slaves. And there with a kind of... Um, you know, quasi-African style um, setting. There on the left, Mary Wollstonecraft's place setting, also showing some of the key moments in Mary Wollstonecraft's life that are important for history and important for women's history. Here's a close-up of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's place setting, which is done in an 18th century style of embroidery, which is appropriate because Mary Wollstonecraft was an 18th century English writer. Some of the things she did here on the front of her place setting is represented the book that she wrote, the most important book she wrote, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. She was friends with a lot of political philosophers, you know, of the day, like John Locke, very influential thinkers. And she wrote a, a book, since all these Enlightenment philosophers were talking about the equality of, of mankind, she wrote a book saying women should be treated as equals too. You know, this shouldn't just extend to men. And uh, actually, this book was one that uh, these other Enlightenment philosophers took seriously, wrote responses to, had correspondence with her about. So Wollstonecraft is important as a political philosopher. She also, as you can see there on the place uh, setting, on the, on the flat part of the table, opened a school for girls to educate them in the same way that boys were educated. So she took in boarding students that she taught in the same curriculum that men got. Typically in the 18th century, what women of her class were educated for was to be able to do embroidery, enough, uh, enough literacy to be able to read the Bible, and then in housekeeping. And so she wanted to push for an equal education in the classics and in, in, um, in literature that men had. Here on the back of her table runner, another pivotal moment in the life of Mary uh, Wollstonecraft, here she is giving birth um, to, <clears throat> to a daughter and dying in the process. So here, I mean, this is another kind of, the kind of thing that is a concern of women's that uh, is not often talked about in, in art generated by men. Uh, and also what's important about this particular birth is the baby she gave birth to grew up to be Mary Shelley, the woman who wrote Frankenstein, so another important woman in cultural history. So here are three important moments of contributions on the part of Mary Wollstonecraft to uh, human society and human culture and human history, the kind of thing that her professor had said women just didn't do. And all done in women's media, all done centering on women's concerns. And this is just a um, study for the runner. Shap or excuse me, Chicago didn't actually do the embroidery. She had other, um, she had community members and students of hers actually working and collaborating on doing the embroidery itself because she could not do embroidery. Uh, so it became this kind of collective project. 
and I just wanted to show you this here. So, I mean, in every way possible, Chicago's Dinner Party Project is trying to be a feminist answer to the studio traditions of men over the centuries, in the treatment of women as subjects as opposed to objects, in the use of craft media that are associated with women, in the celebration of women artists, of bringing them into a collaborative process, rather than having the genius artist alone in his studio standing at an easel painting the naked lady on the couch. All right, so that is where feminist art in the 1970s is going challenging the norms of art history both in who gets written in and written out and in the media and the type of work that's being created. We will meet these folks again. This kind of critique of the standard, you know, um, the, the, the standard interpretation of history and the standard treatment of women in museums continues to go on. In the 1980s, this Guerrilla Girls, the Guerrilla Girls are um, so that's a pseudonym for a group of working professional artists who don these guerrilla masks and then go and stage interventions and protests and performance pieces where they critique the state of things in the current art world. And here in 1989 in this billboard they ask, do women have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum of Art? That's the big flagship institution of New York City. And here, their statistics, less than 5% of the artists in the modern section are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. So there were more than 5% of artists in the modern period are women, uh, but in the collections of the Met, which is one of the ways that you know, history gets written is by what gets put in museums, um, they are only represented as as naked objects, not as subjects, not as active agents. And that continues to be a criticism that the Guerrilla Girls level at the art world. And I'm actually just going to preview this. We're going to talk about Barbara Kruger when we get to the 1980s and 90s. This is Barbara Kruger's um, untitled piece. The you know, assumed title here is Your Gaze Hits the Side of My Face. There you have a kind of Greek or Roman looking female statue. And although it's photographed from the side and she's not looking at you, she's addressing the viewer and saying, I know you are looking at me, challenging the normal dynamic of the way that women are represented in art as things to look at and things that don't look back at you. And that's just a, a little kind of jokey feminist uh, appropriation of 1950s advertising by Barbara Kruger. It's a small world, but not if you have to clean it. And um, I'm not going to talk about this right now. We'll talk about it here in a week or so. Here, a couple of important terms that you ought to know. Um, let's see. Oh, historiography. I don't think I mentioned this term. Historiography is the history of history. Okay? The history of history. And that's part of what's going on in feminism of the 1970s and beyond. So you can pause this page if you need to. Uh, these are terms that you should become familiar with through reading as well as lecture. And um, that's all I have to say for this time, and I will see you next week. Have a great week.